Listen to the new Thin Green Line podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Game wardens John Norris and Wayne Saunders talk about wildlife, the outdoors, law enforcement, environmental subjects mixed with current events and guests that are part of the Thin Green Line. And if you are one of those visual people like me, for $5 a month, you can see the actual podcast on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com and join us. The Copper Pig Brewery in Lancaster, New Hampshire, is brewing traditional and innovative high-quality beers, as well as serving a large menu of creative comfort foods, appealing to all walks of life, with daily specials sourcing many ingredients locally. Charitable involvement and support of their community is the cornerstone to the Copper Pig Brewery's mission. Voted number one in New Hampshire by WMUR Viewers' Choice two years in a row, 2018 and 2019. Please join me at the Copper Pig. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join huntofalifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch. Episode 52, Carlos Gomez, Oklahoma. Carlos is one of those, uh, he's a warden among wardens, I'm going to say, John, because when when you brought up Carlos and then I first talked to Carlos, I thought I was talking to a guy late 20s, maybe early 30s with the energy that that man has. And then I, I call, call you and I said, hey, how old's Carlos? And you were, you, 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 you <laughs> take that away, man, because uh, people aren't going to even, when they listen to Carlos, they're going to be like, this is crazy that this guy's uh, got this much energy at this point in his career. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, I met Carlos for the first time, Wayne, last year at the Nuiya conference at our annual game warden conference in Oklahoma City. And uh, Hidden War had just dropped. And the first conversation I had with him was his connection to Nuiya, you know, and the, the international game warden uh, group and, and all of that for promoting to marketing all we do on the Thin Green Line and instantly liked him. You know, I mean, he was taking calls and doing all this stuff for International Game Warden Magazine and doing ad space and, you know, working with the uh, Nawia board and all of that while he was on patrol. So he'd be taking calls while he's like out in the sticks and having to pause a conversation with me because he was on a case. And I mean, it wasn't a typical 30 year career like you and I had. I mean, Carlos retired after 41 years and something I admire about him is this is not your, uh, you know, the stereotype we never want to fall into as game wardens is being a windshield warden, right? Where we never get out of the truck as we get later in our careers, you know, we're kind of run down, our bodies are beat up. So we're, we kind of take the, you know, for lack of a better word, the lower road, a path of least resistance sometimes. Mm. And he's Carlos is the energizer bunny. 
this guy's rock and rolling hard cases in his late fifties and even older pushing right up to the day he retired. And that is mm. so admirable. He, he's got such a positive energy and, and he, like you and I, he wants to continue to promote outreach and education for the thin green line of conservation officers everywhere into retirement. And he's got 10 plus years on you and I, and we we're motivated and uh, you know, we, it, it's tough to keep up with what we're doing. So in a nutshell, great game warden, great man, generous, uh, uh, fired up, energetic, and motivating because of that energy. Yes. I call him the energizer bunny of game wardens. I love this guy. Yeah, and so do man, I. Did he, have some good, he shared some good cases with us on this, on this show. Yeah, absolutely. And we start off, one of his biggest cases he was involved with is towards the end of his career with Operation New Jersey, which uh, takes turtles, the capture of turtles, yeah. and puts them into the pet market. And he explains that so well. And he talks about that case and the, the federal involvement with that, which is great that we just uh, probably thought of the first warden's watch is that we actually talk about the federal involvement and how it crosses state lines and where that comes because they, they named this Operation New Jersey and it's, it's in Oklahoma is where it's prosecuted. But all those turtles that they were capturing were on their way to New Jersey. Like so much of our federal cases, when they cross our state lines, we bring in the feds uh, and we start working together. And it's kind of neat because you get to work with the other states as well as the federal agents and that that's really cool uh, and he brings that all to light yeah and I, I love operation new jersey from the standpoint of what you just said it's not as a patrol warden in a small state how many opportunities are you going to get to go work at a state mm. and go kind of to a bigger commercial wildlife picture when things get transported across state lines either for poaching for greed uh for you know bragging rights or worse yet for commercialization right right and when the feds get involved we have the lacy act which enhances so many of our crimes to felonies once a uh, poaching case in any individual state crosses a state line. So for you and I and Carlos at the state level, those are the those are the career cases that matter because they have the biggest effect on wildlife nationally, not just in our individual states. And we, you know, I worked no, a number of those cases being from a very busy state of California, and I was lucky to do so. Uh, but I talked to a lot of officers, you know, in the Midwest and back east that worked for smaller departments, and they didn't get to do a lot of Lacey Act cases, and and that's too bad because I think we. I know you and I can mostly speak to how much we learn from doing a, a, an interstate transport case with other mm. states, prosecuted at the federal level, use the CFR code of regulations at the federal level. And we get a bigger bite too federally on some of these cases when the U.S. attorney gets involved mm -hmm. on an egregious wildlife case. And uh, the public takes notice of those fines and those penalties, and they see it as more serious, not a, a small scale wildlife crime. And, and that was one of Carlos' highlight cases that everyone's going to love listening to. Yeah, and that's one of your exit. One of the other cases he talks about just, uh, and we're going to have a visual for this. So when we put that out, I think everybody's going to go yeah, crazy. Yeah, I know this one. <laughs> the, the polar bear in the back of the cruiser that's all encased oh, in yeah. a nice plexiglass thing that uh, it's just, it's an eye catcher for sure. Uh, polar bear in Oklahoma. And he talks about uh, how possession, you need the proper paperwork to possess it, even if it's legal. Polar bears, if they were shot you know, prior to a certain date, are illegal. But this guy just didn't have the paperwork. And uh, Carlos talks about that case that he took on. And it, he's just the kind of guy that grabs cases and, and runs with them. And I just, I just find that great. Uh, he just, you know, like that turtle case, you could write to someone, and he talks about it, you can write the little ticket, and those guys will pay their $200 ticket all day long because they're making so much money off these turtles it's when you take right. that small case and you're like hey there's something bigger here let's kick this up a level let's do a little more investigation let's make this operation yep. new jersey which on the the game warden level that's that's the what we got to do we got to up our game to make those big cases and to make it and then his case he talks about a, one of the, the first cases he made because i wanted a deer case i always love a deer case Talks about right, this. Gotta have a gotta have that deer case in the arsenal, man. We all do, hopefully. Yeah, but he, he pulls this deer case out, John. That I, like I've never seen a twenty-three point non-typical that he seizes right. uh, for hunting on an improper property, and then again he peels back that onion and starts finding other cases and, and makes some some pretty a, a, impressive cases off this one. And then they have a taxidermy, and it's in their office, the twenty-three pointer. So we're gonna have pictures of that up on our Instagram and such like that, so people can see just the. Dyna dynamic individual let's face it and whether it's the 23 pointer or the polar bear in the back of the cruiser or operation new jersey with uh turtles and and we got around two with carlos too this is just this is the first part of a two-part uh interview yeah just a dynamic individual that's that's but was a lot of fun and a lot of energy and i really appreciated him 
Yeah, you guys are um, our listeners. You guys are really going to enjoy this part one. Um, it gets hot and heavy, like like we're discussing now, and we won't give away part two. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But part two is just as dynamic as part one, given uh, what Carlos represents for the Thin Green Line, and uh, you guys are going to enjoy it. So, episode fifty-two, Carlos Gomez, Oklahoma, and this is our first one out of Oklahoma. Thank you for listening to Warden's Watch. <laughs> I've been to Oklahoma once for an International Wildlife Crime Stoppers conference, Carlos, and I'm trying to think what year that was. It was like 2014, 2015, right in there. David Decker was involved with the International mm-hmm. Wildlife Crime Stoppers. All I remember it was really, really hot. Good people, good food, and really hot for a northern New Hampshire boy, I'll tell you that. But beautiful, beautiful yeah. country, beautiful people. And one thing I've found out about Carlos, he's got more energy than anybody I know. And for a, a warden that's had 41 years of service, when I, when I was talking to you early on, I had to ask John Norris, I'm like, how old is Carlos? Because he's retiring, but he sounds like he's about 30 and just good on the job. And that, that, that to me is amazing that you go out with that much energy, Carlos, and that much passion. As, as a lot of us do. But to carry that on through 41 years and two months is pretty dang impressive to me. I, I, want, I want you to know that. And one of your big cases uh, rolled out at the end, right? It's in your Oklahoma Wildlife Magazine currently. Right. This came in the mail today. Well, tell me about that. And, and I kind of the, the headlines there, Jersey, the Jersey case. I, I just, when I see Jersey, I think cases for sure. <laughs> right. Well, it, it, it's uh, it's Operation Jersey, and it was named that by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a state magazine, and we're state wardens. And so uh, I told the story from that perspective, but uh, a lot of this case, including the name Operation Jersey, uh, came from the hard work of our uh, fish and wildlife agent, Matt Bryant. Matt Bryant has been stationed in Oklahoma and been the only agent we've had for a number of years uh, he just recently took over, moved down to Dallas and, and took over both Texas and Oklahoma. It, it was his case that he spearheaded after we handed off a lot of evidence and facts and information and contacts that, that helped break the case for him. And uh, he used his contacts, of course, agents and New Jersey officers, and, um, and they worked it from that side as well. So it ended up getting prosecuted here in federal court in Tulsa. Uh, Matt worked it on both ends and, 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 you know, like a lot of our federal agents, they handle only the very biggest cases. They don't get too involved in, in too many things. If you've been a game warden very long, you know that, uh, you can't even get them to get too excited about a bald eagle. Somebody's done something with a bald eagle. It's like, well, handle that in state court. You know, if, if you've got a, if you've got a bald eagle ring, or if you've got, you know, selling bald eagles, or if you've got somebody that's doing something much bigger on an international scale or, or certainly an interstate uh, scale, they're all over it. He's been a good agent for us, and we have a great relationship, and we were real proud of him uh, for the years that he's spread himself pretty thin around. It's frustrating for us as well, though, you know, because mm-hmm. it's hard to always remember he's the only guy, and, and he's got a family and a yard to mow just like everybody else. So the federal government's going to let him work only so many hours a week, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, he's got to pick and choose where he turns his focus to. And he handled this case. And and uh, as the story tells in this magazine, the investigation on this case began at least a year before this happened. And, and, and I guess I could say two years before, because this case and prosecution and so forth took about a year. But about a year prior to that was when... Uh, uh, Matt Bryant met with all of our captains at a captain's meeting at headquarters on regular monthly staff meeting and said, hey, I need you guys to be on guard. And uh, we, we've, we've got something in the percolating here on, on turtles and we need to get a, get a hold of it and get a handle on it. And he was asking game wardens to find some turtles. They didn't have a plan. They didn't really know what they were going to do, but they knew they needed undercover turtles and <laughs> they wanted to be able to have something to be able to ship and sell to certain people that they that they were trying to um, capture and they knew that they were in the market of 
buying and selling and trafficking in these turtles. So, you know, turtles are everywhere and they're nowhere. So you see them crossing the road, but when you see them, you don't see a herd of them. You see a turtle. So anyway, the game wardens were not very successful. And I would probably say it's because game wardens just don't get real excited about a turtle. They don't get excited about the turtle crossing the road. And if you catch the turtle crossing the road, now you got to, now the feds need another 20 or 30 turtles. What good is one or two or five or seven, you know? So that's what they were running into with their turtle operation. And, and, and a year had gone by when, when this case fell in our lap, so to speak. Uh, It was just one of those things, I guess you could say was meant to be. I don't know, Wayne, if you want to talk about this case in the particulars and go into that or what do you, what do you uh, I'd love to just the fact that it said Jersey it has far reaching turtles are yeah. big. You know, I mean, I know J- Josiah town, our conservation officer, you know, he's been on Northwoods law and he, he's kind of coined turtle power because uh, he's got a special relationship with turtles. I think it's because his kids like uh, teenage mutant ninja turtles, but you know, turtles aren't some kinds of a story that we hear about a lot, but yet in the pet industry, we're seeing a lot of them. And there's a lot of illegal activity. And, and with wildlife, things shift and, you know, whether it's turtles this day, elvers the next, uh, gallbladders from bears, you know, it's, it's a shifting market. And I think, don't, wouldn't you agree, turtles are hot right now? Yeah, and I'd like to say that us game wardens are on top of everything. But oftentimes, you know, we're a year or two behind when we hear and catch up to what's going on, whether it's reptile trade, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of these... Uh, uh, reptile shows where they travel around and they'll set up in the convention center and everybody is mm-hmm. is selling and trading alligators and caimans and and boas and all kinds of stuff well they've got the stuff they're not supposed to sell under the table in a tub mm-hmm. and you got to know the special handshake to get somebody to bring out the secret tub and make a, a special trade on a on an endangered species or something like that uh, the, the people in those trades trafficking in those things, they know who's who's dealing in the stuff they shouldn't be dealing in. Now, somebody will tell every once in a while, but game wardens hear about that stuff a little after the fact. You know, they don't they don't advertise on Facebook that I'm selling an endangered species who wants this. So it's one of those things that when we finally get wind of it, you know, the show was last week, last month, last year. We get we get an idea who the bad guy is, but I think that's what happened to the feds in New Jersey is they they had an idea who their guy was, but they didn't know how they were going to roll him up. Basically, you know, we had been watching for for turtles and turtle trafficking and things like that. but We hadn't really found anything. And and uh, lo and behold, a uh, lady at work in a motel uh, innkeeper had uh, grew her own suspicions because the the guests in these two rooms did not want her going in the room. And that (laughs) went on for a week. And after a week, she knew that, hey, I need to at least check on my room, you know. So she peeks in the door when they're not there, and she sees all these tubs of turtles. Uh, With that, she called the local police. You know, she's not a fish and game person, but she knew this don't look right. So Mm -hmm. she calls the local police, and he calls the local game warden. And that's in the county next door to me. The officer, Carlin Bailey, who's been a warden for about 30 years himself, he knew that we had been put on alert about watching for turtles and things like that. And and he also knew that uh, being in Tulsa County, I had been involved in several search warrants and investigations over here Mm -hmm. regarding different small fry that were dealing in turtles. We had one case in particular where where an employee of... of, um, UPS contacted us and said, I've got this box with a bunch of pencil holes poked in it that's full of turtles. She's just a, she's just an assembly line box mover. Mm -hmm. And she's, but, but she was smart enough to know that this is not right. This something here is wrong and this needs to be looked at. Well, UPS was bad about squashing their employees for speaking up they no don't you cause any trouble with clients here we just move boxes now shut up and move the boxes she she cared enough that she stuck her neck out and, and called us and and yeah we we found who was sending the turtles and we knew uh, kind of who they were sending it to but again there's there's a lot of small players that try to get in on a big plan Mm-hmm. And so you don't know who the big kingpin is. You just right. find out that you got a lot of middle guys trying to become bigger guys. 
anyway, so Carlin knew that I was involved in a couple smaller cases like that where we had worked on some turtle stuff. So he calls me and says, hey, I don't know really what I got here, but it might be something big. So come over and look at it with me. My supervisor met us over there and we scoped it out and basically surprised them with a knock and talk. And, you know, they knew that they had turtles there and they knew we knew they had turtles there. So they opened up and we visited about it. And, you know, these guys had been caught before in other states, but they would just get a state ticket for a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they're shipping off literally $4,000 worth of turtles every two days. Wow. What's a couple hundred dollar ticket? Nothing. They're happy to pay it and just move on down the road Mm -hmm. and be a little more careful about getting caught next time. In this particular case, um, you know, we, we kind of suspected it was a big deal. And I, I happened to know a few things from these other smaller cases and having talked to the fed a little bit, I asked a few questions that turned out to be the right questions. And, you know, we ended up getting information on who the kingpin was and, what the shipments were and how much he was paying. And when, you know, we had receipts on when they had paid and, and what they had paid and who they'd paid to and yada, yada, yada. We had all that stuff and we were able to give that to the feds and we, and that's the Jersey connection. That was the right, Jersey right. connection. The guy in, in New Jersey. And it just turns out that my suspect in this little motel mm-hmm. in a little town in, in Northeast Oklahoma, he's got, a screenshot of a guy's name and phone number and city. And it's the exact same guy that the feds have been trying to focus on mm. for two years. Yep. So we put all that together and the, uh, the guy ended up uh, informing, but still ended up getting prosecuted on the state level and, and got some penalties for his roles and stuff, but he obviously got a, a, a better deal and, and the feds were able to use him work their way, into the New Jersey end of things. They found that they found that the turtles being picked up on Oklahoma County roads were generating $5 per turtle for the guy that picked the turtle up. Mm -hmm. Then they found that the guy that's paying the $5 was getting $25 per turtle from the guy in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And the, the guy that was paying the $5 he had, a, he had a crew of people that were staying in an adjoining room to his motel room there, see? And, and he sent them out in different cars on county roads looking for turtles. Mm. And they, they would bring back, they'd bring back what they found on the county roads every day. He's paying $5. He's receiving $25. And the guy in New Jersey was receiving $100. And mm. some of the more ornate three-toed turtles that are more rare would bring up to $500. Wow. And... Then the West Coast connection people sending them overseas, those top end, high end survivors that that made that made the smuggling journey would bring a thousand, five thousand, and and some even up to ten thousand dollars for Jeez. a turtle. Wow! And people have a hard time figuring on that. They're going, "You got to be kidding me! A turtle? What's up with a turtle? Mm. Oh, we got them everywhere. What's the deal with that? What a thousand dollars for a turtle? Right. Well." I asked, I asked people to look around uh, in the pet stores right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And what do you see? Do you see? Do you see box turtles? Do you see Oklahoma wildlife? You don't. You see exotic stuff that comes from other countries. Mm. Now, hopefully those things were uh, hatched out and raised right here somewhere and sold and are, are marketed in a lawful way in some kind of a regulated commerce way. But we know that the parrots and parakeets that everybody loves to have in the corner of the living room in a little cage did not come from Southeast Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that wasn't something we caught in a bird box out on the porch. That thing was hatched in its generations from some other country. And so in China, they don't have these turtles. And of course, and, and I'll just tell you, and, and I won't mince words. I, I don't have any affection for, for the country of China and all the problems they've, they've cast upon us. Mm. But, China eats everything <laughs> and what they don't eat, they sell mm-hmm. and uh, that they, they don't care about other countries, sovereignty and other countries rules and so forth. Those people are about getting everything and anything they can get. So they literally are, you know, paying top dollar to have something that's exotic and the most wealthy uh, oligarch people in China 
want something that other people don't have. And a turtle was, was, was a rarity. And if it's real ornate box turtle and got three toes, holy smokes, that's, that's as special as it gets. Right. That makes me as special as I can be. So right. look what I got. You don't have. And, and so those things raise the top dollar. It's kind of like the parakeet, you might say, or the cockatoo or something that uh, right. somebody wants to have. Nobody, not a lot of other people have those. Right. And China and Oklahoma yeah. turtle, that must, that, that brings a good, some good money. Cause you're absolutely right. China, Oklahoma, yeah, that's from Oklahoma, the United spot. States. That that's cool. <laughs> yeah. No so, doubt. No anyway, doubt. they're superstitious people too. You know, they're looking for something that brings them good luck and something that, mm-hmm. that you, you know, they got their year of the rat and all kinds of other stuff that they do that it's always some kind of animal that has some representation of, of what's to come uh, with their good fortune that year or something. And so the turtle, anyway, as I understand it, brought them good luck and it was a symbol of, of success. Right. Yeah, certainly about the culture. And that's exactly what we're fighting when we're fighting these wildlife wars is fighting a culture that mm-hmm. absolutely, what you said, brings in superstition, brings in tradition. And fighting it on that level is, uh, it, it's hard to break a culture and what they bring to it. What I did see is uh, shark fin soup. Uh, they, they actually did a, a commercial there that shows shark fin soup and actually reduced the, the people eating shark fin soup due to the effect on the environment because the younger, younger generation of Chinese actually, you know, have, have see the effects in that. So sometimes, you know, it's just not the game warden. It's the advertiser that, that puts together a nice little thing and shows the, 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 the effect of, you know, poaching wildlife or overuse of wildlife has on, on its uh, population. That's that's pretty cool. It, you know, the other th- federal well, thing, then we, 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 I threw this out early, and I didn't know if I'd take this out earlier or not, but it was a federal case. Oklahoma, when I heard Oklahoma, I think uh, Tiger King, which is another exotic. We're not talking turtles. We're talking tigers right there in Oklahoma. That's been, you know, a, a Netflix miniseries. It's, uh, he, he's been in the front row of uh, a lot of wildlife um, radars so to speak, mm-hmm. and currently in mm-hmm. jail, opening President Trump's going to pardon him out of jail. I, I've heard that too, but I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. I think, I think that boat sailed. That yeah. boat sailed. <laughs> and you got, you, you actually had interactions with him and had issues with him. Uh, did you work on the federal case at all? I did. Uh, not the one that you're referring to, not the recent one that made him so famous. Mm-hmm. Um, and Wayne, forgive me if I if I can. I want to cut back just for a split second to Operation Jersey. Please do, and, and say one little point that we left out. Yeah. Uh, what made this case stand out in Oklahoma was it got us the uh, largest fine we've ever had in the state of Oklahoma. And again, that's a credit to the Fish and Wildlife Service and the and the federal courts. They assessed the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar penalty nice. um, to go to our agency awesome. uh, for wildlife restoration and a hundred thousand dollars for investigation expenses for the fed. So this is a $350,000 penalty that came out of that specific case state where we're used to getting excited about a $10,000 penalty. Um, 350 awesome. is, is something that, that I'm proud of. So you should be anyway, back to the tiger King. No. And I, I, I want to I'll tell you that, 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 that fine is awesome. And that just shows the gravity of it. And thank goodness that the mm-hmm. courts saw the gravity yeah. of it. And, and I think we're, we're starting, especially on those types of things, we're starting to see the gravity of it. Uh, sometimes I know our deer cases get poo-pooed because we seem to have a lot of deer. And sometimes the judge hit a deer on his way to court or something and doesn't see yeah. see that deer as a, as a treasure like uh, yeah. some of us do. But uh, certainly that's, that's an awesome uh, achievement. So. And very, very good well, work, and, Carlos. And, and, and you know, a, a point that you made, Wayne, that I that I want to touch on too about uh, the courts seeing the gravity of this case. In all wildlife cases, uh, I hate to be the, the the guy that points a finger at ourselves, but the game warden, unlike police departments and other you know detectives and people that that carry cases through the courts. The game warden is the guy that does it all. He's the guy that does the investigation. Mm. He does the CSI. Yes. He does the interview. He does the forensics. He does the, um, the the prosecution and meets with the DAs. He writes all the reports. He he does everything. And if this case falls through the cracks, it's because the game warden didn't do something. And, and I hate to say it, it'd be nice if we were uh, big like some 
prosecutorial agency that had seven divisions and each division handled something and they all did a great job. We don't have a, a CSI truck that we can call in uh, to collect evidence, right? We, right? we use our own metal detector to find a bullet or whatever we're doing and we're digging through the carcass and we're the guy that, you know, I used to have deer poaching cases that were made because I had a friend at the medical examiner's office. And when there wasn't a fresh human body on the table, he'd let me bring a deer in and he'd do a forensic on that and do yeah. a cause of death report. It was just like it was a human. Yeah. And from that, I drafted up a, a, uh, a forensic sheet like he used where it shows the torso of a human with all the injuries and yeah. all that on it, you know, and I did that for the ME and I produce those and and he'd write up on those where the bullet went in and what the cause of death and yada yada and he'd he'd do those details for the court and the court got excited about that they liked that they, mm. that illustrated for them that showed them what they needed to see that when this defendant was saying oh your honor it was it was staggering and it was already injured whenever i shot it uh, that I shot it with an arrow, that bullet, you know, had to have hit it from somebody else long before I got him. And mm. the medical examiner's report would show that that deer died from that bullet within three seconds or something. Yeah. So, you know, a game warden has to do these special effort things right. to make the court see the importance of the case. And so again, this goes back to Matt Bryant and the feds and these guys prosecuting this case. And and, and showing a judge all these details that he needs to see about the scope, the mm. size, the damage that they're doing to the ecosystem in a particular region of a country or whatever. And, and of course, you probably know these turtles and this trafficking is going on all over the eastern seaboard. It's in southeast United States. Right. It's all along the Gulf. These guys have been caught in Arkansas. They've been caught in Louisiana, the same guys. The turtle trafficking is going on from all these other states. They're all catching people and prosecuting people just like Oklahoma did. So it's it's a case where we have to show the courts everything they need to see, because as you and I discussed earlier, a lot of our judges are not hunters and fishermen. A lot of our prosecutors are not hunters and fishermen. They complain about having a stack of, of uh, felony cases laying on their desk. And the game warden shows up with a with a with a rabbit case, and they like to call it that, you know, to, to mm. kind of minimize what we're showing them. They say, "And you come in here with a rabbit case, and you want me to get excited?" They they're just not sportsmen, so they don't understand what our nation has come through since the late eighteen hundreds when we wiped everything out and we took seventy five years to restore it, mm. and now for the last seventy five years since the restoration, it has done nothing but flourish, and we're back to where in some cases we're better than we were right uh, before the white man came and plundered everything. Right. So now that we've got so much, like you said, the judges are going, well, I hit a deer on the way to work. Why do you want me to penalize somebody? We mm -hmm. got too many of them. Well, you got to educate them. These people don't get an education about our wildlife getting plundered. And so a game warden's got to do that. Absolutely. And our game warden, and I, I'll, I'll shut up on my tirade here in a second. The last thing I want to say is the game wardens are hell bent to chase a guy down and catch a guy. They want to catch the guy. They want to file the ticket. And then they want to go catch another guy. That's <laughs> and when they're going to going to catch another guy, they they blow off that case and they leave it to a DA that doesn't hunt and fish. And, they, and then they complain about how their case didn't get handled well and didn't get prosecuted. You got to guard that case all the way through to the bitter end uh -huh. and treat it like you're trying to nurse a baby. Because if you don't, it ends up, you know, on life support or worse and – the, the game warden's going, hey, I, I gave you a case on a silver platter. What happened? Well, the guy got a defense attorney, or the guy said he didn't do it. Mm. The guy <laughs> the guy said he, he he said it was staggering for, from a bullet hole already. Game warden's got to be there at every turn and be at every arraignment, even though the prosecutor says, Oh, you don't need to be there. It's not gonna be a it's not gonna be a final ending to the case. It's just an arraignment. You better be there. Mm. Because it's at the arraignment, the guy will say something, and the game warden did this to me, and uh, you know this is what happened. And the judge says, "Is this true? Is this is this true, uh, counselor?" And the prosecutor goes, "Well, your honor, the game warden not here. I don't know." And he let, "Well, I think we're going to just let this go for a hundred dollars." And you know, I mean, that's what happens. The game mm -hmm. warden's got to guard these things. Well, uh, you're so. you're absolutely correct, Carlos, and build those relationships with those prosecutors. If they have any questions, they at least call you and get that. Yeah, I, I you bring up so many cases through my tenure that I, I could think the same thing happened. You know, you let a case go, or you get somebody that had never dealt with a, a wildlife case and they get excited, and then they're all about it. 
So I, I had uh, two federal prosecutors because I used to use, work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife as a refuge officer. I wrote a bunch of tickets. Well, half went to a, an assistant U.S. attorney, and the other half went to another one. One wrote them all off, dismissed them all, basically. And the other one was excited about them, so we went to trial on every one. And I was when I was there, I asked, well, what happened to all my other cases? And all those were assigned to another U.S. attorney. And uh, they all got ri- written off. You know, like you said, they didn't do it. They did plea bargains that were just ridiculous, were just pled away. You know, a closed season on ducks. Closed season on ducks, pled away, placed on file. Uh, I was just, so, yeah, so, uh, and that was young in my career too. But you're right. If you follow those cases through, you, you get those relationships on the other side, the other guy was excited to have a, a over of ducks, and he never had this in federal court before. And it was the last time that judge was sitting. And he said, uh, he got up on his uh, soapbox there and said, uh, sons, I want you to let you know this here's a part-time job for me. I'm a professional duck hunter. And he asked, he's like, <laughs> he's like that over limit, was that all greenheads? And they were like, uh, no, your honor. And then he had continued to throw the book at him. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm sure you, in your tenure, you probably had judges just like that, didn't you? Oh yeah. And you know, people on the inside of this kind of business will say, well, uh, there's what they call judge shopping, right? Where you, you do, you do, you do prosecutor shopping <clears throat> and you do judge shopping. And sometimes, sometimes you go to the prosecutor, you know, that's going to, uh, you know, I, I jokingly told you, and I've had to do this before, where I had to follow a prosecutor to the urinal. So he'd give me a couple of minutes to talk to him about my case <laughs> because he just doesn't have the time. I'm sorry. I just don't have the time to mess with your rabbit cases. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, uh, you find the prosecutor that gives a rip and then uh, in, in time you find the judge that gives a rip and, uh, uh, don't, don't kid yourself. The, the defense attorneys, they also know the judges that are their friends that they golf with that don't give a rip and they'll, they'll petition all they can to try to get in front of a a particular judge or to get a judge to make a ruling or something, uh, you know, determine some kind of an outcome about this evidence or something that may not even be related to this case. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's a lot of that behind the scenes shopping stuff I think that goes on, but basically I want somebody that just knows, Mm. like you said, like that judge that understands what duck hunting is. So when you talk about a plug or when you talk about steel shot or when you talk about, uh, you know, whatever things that they're doing or not doing, the judge understands, mm-hmm. you know, he's not ignorant and his time is important. The, the, the dockets are stacked up. And of course now, like never before with the COVID, we don't even have trials. We don't even have courts. They just, they just give defendants a phone number and say, have them call this phone number. And they try to dispose the case over a phone conversation. Mm. Uh, so there's not even anybody coming to court unless it's uh, murder, rape or, or, you know, armed robbery or something like that. Uh, strong arm robbery, you know, here's a phone number. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's pretty, pretty bad because the courts are backed up right. because everybody in the COVID and all that. So anyway, uh, it's, it's important to, to, I think, educate people. And, and I was telling you about every five to 10 years, I'd get a prosecutor that cared about a case that cared about wildlife that likes to hunt and fish. And that prosecutor typically, even when he moves up the food chain and becomes a prosecutor of felony cases and becomes on the felony team and does big drugs and all this, whatever stuff that gets him more high profile and a bigger paycheck and, and a raise, so to speak, I would have a prosecutor about every seven years or so, 10 years that would come down the pike and say, you know what, even though I'm on the felony team, you come find me when you got a good deer case or a good poaching case, I want it. Mm -hmm. I'll take time away from my regular stuff, working with the feds and working with the police and working with all these other big cases, because I want to, I want to get my teeth into those guys. Yeah. Typically a game warden doesn't take a case to the courthouse unless it's a really big deal. If it's a, if it's a little deal, we explain to the guy or I try to, and I hope would hope a lot of game wardens would know to do this. When I started out, a lot of game wardens would just, write a ticket and get in their car and drive away. There wasn't a whole lot of explanation. Your court mm-hmm. date's written right there, sir. The charge is right there. Have a good day. And the guy's in, he writes a ticket, he's out, and I'll see you later. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you you benefit when you'll spend a little bit of time with the guy. Not only are you going to hopefully develop a little relationship because 
a game violator might also be a sportsman that might also be a licensed buyer that might also be a supporter of conservation if he's educated. And, mm. and this is your opportunity to educate the guy a little bit about what the regulation is, why it is, and da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, I like to educate them as to why I'm not writing you $3,000 worth of tickets. I'm just going to write you $1,000 worth. Mm -hmm. And I like to explain to them, here's the charges. Here's what we could do. Here's what maybe you, you deserve, but at the minimum, I'm going to do this with you. And the guy says, okay. And I'm paraphrasing maybe a a, a three hour torture chamber sitting in my truck. I'll I'll tell the guy a thousand dollars. I'm doing you a deal. And Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to write you that ticket. And the guy says, I'll I'll plead guilty to that. Mm. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about, it. but you know, we've had some cases like that where a guy pled guilty and the DA still cut it back to a hundred dollars right. or he still ended up doing something that screwed the case up with a guilty plea where the guy pled guilty in the field. Yeah. I like to get a, a, a confession in writing. I explain to them everything. I, I explain to them how they got a $3,000 ticket. They're only going to pay $1,500 today. Yada, yada, yada. And, and we go down the road. But you can make a relationship with that game violator and you can educate him about why he got that penalty and explain to him, hey, I'm a hunter too, okay? I'm not against hunters. You you know as well as I do, Wayne, we got the sportsmen out there that are saying, get them, get them, kill them, put them under the jail. And then Mm. you've got the bunny huggers that are saying, get them, get them, get them, kill them, put them under the jail. Well, we're hunters too. We've got to kind of cater to both parties, right? And we Mm -hmm. want to bunny huggers to call us and we want them to report people and we want them to testify and be a good witness. But we've got to, we've got to protect hunters. We've got to protect hunting. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we protect poaching. Right. I I just, I just mean, I want to educate people. And I think game wardens are, are have a good opportunity when they catch somebody, they could just kick their butt and go down the road. But what they really need to do is spend a little bit of time trying to build a relationship with every person that they deal with and maybe, just maybe, at least the guy understands, okay, well, he treated me fair. I was wrong, and I know I did such and such. And it maybe it helps the cause a little bit. Right. So we got way off base. We, we did. We did. Back. I go down these rabbit trails quite often. <laughs> and I think it was a good rabbit trail to go down to, and we got a lot of good information out there, Carlos. But the Tiger King. <laughs> and, and I yeah, want to know. You know <laughs> Yeah, my, my Tiger King experience is, is over 20 years ago. Uh, the it, Tiger King has been involved with fish and game violations for years, for a long, long time. Yes. And, uh, you know, as many game violators that are doing stuff that don't change their ways, mm-hmm. and if they got a little bit of a loose screw, they tend to keep doing stuff over and over again. So the feds were working on him because there was all kinds of trafficking and tigers and alligators and alligators are endangered in Oklahoma. Of course, you know, they're prolific in Southeast states, but in Oklahoma, they're considered one of our native species. We have very few of, Hmm. and so it's not a federal endanger. And when I think Oklahoma, that's the last thing I think of is alligators. Right. And we've got some slough country down in Southeast Oklahoma that gets very close to Louisiana and we've got some native alligators down there so for that reason alligators have been listed as an endangered species so these guys were bad about trafficking in alligators and of course all kinds of other prohibited uh snakes and things and Mm. and tigers and lions and bears uh i can tell you 30 plus years ago oklahoma had to play catch up on some laws about what you could have as a pet what kind of stuff could be bought and sold and and there's been a lot of uh, trafficking between the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Agriculture, Customs, the state wildlife agencies as to who's going to handle the hot potato. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these things that have been under that jurisdiction and then some law gets changed and now it's under these people's jurisdiction. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, a lot of things like that uh, have changed over the years that some of it's for the better and some of it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, game wardens at one time were in charge of lions and tigers. We're no longer in charge of lions and tigers. Uh, game wardens used to be in charge of white-tailed deer farming. And you would think a game warden should be have something to say about white-tailed deer farming. Mm-hmm. But we don't. That's been given to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, like, uh, like their cattle now. So... Those guys are doing all kinds of things with white-tailed deer, and we got CWD concerns that involve those people. 
And the Department of Wildlife is not the ones that regulate that. That's the Department of Ag. So uh, mm. a lot of that went on. And 30 years ago, uh, we had people getting mauled by tigers in downtown Oklahoma City at some at some show, at some deal where they were leading tigers around on a leash, just doing stupid things. But there wasn't regulations about it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, there was all kinds of different investigations and things that went on. And and I actually went with some feds down into Texas. There were people that were that were trading and selling these critters that were in Kansas and the, and in the state of Texas. And, and of course we had people in Oklahoma that we were investigating, but the tiger King has been in Oklahoma, South of Oklahoma city for, for a long, long time. And I'm going on memory and you're talking about an old man's memory. So (laughs) I don't expect to give you all the dates and, and details, but I'll just tell you that we've, we've wrote him lots of tickets because like a lot of people that want to, uh, befriend the wildlife department, get away with certain things. They want to be your friend and they want to mm-hmm. help you with things. And the tiger King said, Hey, I'll be a wildlife rehabilitator. Well, one of those things that he was rehabilitating was alligators. Next thing we know, the alligators are no longer in his pond where they <laughs> should have been. Where, where'd they go? Well, I, I don't know. They must've got out. <laughs> well, Tigers and alligators and lions and things like that were getting traded around. And that was, that was 20 plus 30 years. 30 plus years ago. Yeah. And so this stuff that he's just done recently is just, just came to a head. Uh, more of the same. He, he, he just kind of kept going over the deep edge. You might say. Yeah. Nope. That, that, that's cool. Cause that's the first time we've been able to talk about, we talk about the turtles. That's an exotic. We talk about the tigers. That's an exotic. It's basically exotics to our listeners are things that really don't belong here. They, they, they weren't here originally. And we brought them in. Some are kept as pets. A lot of them are kept as pets. For mm-hmm. sure. So I think uh, I think last reported, Mexico has more lions and tigers than any place in the world, and a lot of them use them for protection on tops of the flat roofs. And I don't know mm. if that's changed in the last ten years or not, but that was uh, that was that was pretty uh, recent. So you jump on a, somebody in Mexico City's roof, and there's a lion or tiger up there, and and it's not a pet. <laughs> <laughs> that makes them jump right back off that roof. It? it certainly does. It certainly does. Uh, just just some really interesting facts, and and that just comes up because I think Oklahoma, I think uh, the Tiger King, because that's been in the news lately. It's been on Netflix. I watched the series. If nothing else, I found it interesting and in the exotic uh, and it shows you the lifestyles of a lot of the people that deal in exotics as well too it, it's it, like you said it's very mm-hmm. sometimes they can be very strange people and they just they gravitate to exotic wildlife when you're an exotic person i guess so yeah. <laughs> wow 41 years you got a lot to talk about and i, and I want to hear all of it carlos because uh, how about your your best case is that i, I mean that 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 turtle one is a great case, but uh, you got, do you have one you can top that one with? I mean, you went out with, with a great case and did you come in with a great case? I have, I have a case, a deer poaching case that I made when I was fresh out of police. You know, it sticks out in my memory because it was my first uh, night poaching case. It's all a matter, I guess, of how you score them. The, the, <laughs> the turtle case obviously scored well on the penalty end of things. Yes. Um, Typically, you know, us game wardens, we get thought of as the guy that, that stops deer poaching and, and things like that. But mm-hmm. uh, the hunting species that, that we're involved in. But, uh, you know, I've had a lot of cases over the years. I'll tell you, I've been sued a number of times. Mm-hmm. I confiscated a stolen polar bear. Uh, that made big news here in Tulsa. A live one? Uh, no, no. It was, it was a stuffed polar bear. Okay, that's good. That, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was lawfully <laughs> killed in... Uh, in Alaska, back in the '60s, guy stole it from this from their family, and that's that's a story and how he did it. Uh, it let's just call it a, a larceny of private property. He was actually charged with a felony uh, on that particular case, and I ended up getting defended by the state attorney's office, and and I knew it whenever they took it on that, you know, they were going to look at it and try to defend it, but. All the guy has to do is have have an attorney and be a little stubborn and the state pays off like a slot machine. And a lot of people know that. So uh, that's a case that I'm proud of because I helped the rightful owners get their polar bear back. Yeah, the state ended up paying the the turd head a little bit of money uh, to settle and go away. I think think one of the things that game wardens do 
although, you know, like I said, I'm not perfect and I've certainly made mistakes in my career. One of the things I'm proud of is that I do try to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Now, I may do it the wrong way. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I may have violated somebody's rights or somebody's rules somewhere and how I did it, but I'm trying to, uh, you know, do the right thing. And, and, uh, you know, at one time on that polar bear case, I actually called the defendant up and I said, Hey, here's what we got. You got the polar bear, right? Yes. He said, he's got it. And I said, you need to give it back. And here's why. And I explained to him the statutes and so forth. And he says, well, they need to pay me some money for storage. Well, he had no business having it. He took the polar bear without anybody's permission and he's keeping it because he loved it. And he had it in his airplane hangar. And it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a cool deal to him. He's a, he's a, has a float plane. He parked in his hangar. He goes to Alaska all the time. He's got all kinds of big mounts. He's got everything under the sun, full body mounts. What didn't he have? A polar bear. He didn't have a polar bear. (laughs) So now he's got a polar bear and he's real proud of this polar bear. Well, I said, you can't have the polar bear. It's not a, it's not a 57 Chevy you've collected there. It's a polar bear. It's parts of wildlife. You can't have it without this document, that document. He said, well, sound like your lawyer needs to talk to me or needs to talk to my lawyers. What he said, I said, Hey, listen, I don't want to get lawyers involved. All I want to do is let this thing just kind of go away. Give them back their polar bear and let's forget about it. He goes, look, they need to pay me 10 grand or you need to talk to my lawyer. And I said, look, if you need to sue them in civil court, sue them in civil court for your 10 grand. But that's a civil matter. This is a criminal matter involving wildlife. And Mm -hmm. and I don't want to file charges on you. I just want you to give them the polar bear and let's go on down the route. And he said, like I said, you need to have your he said, you need to talk to my lawyer. And he hung up on me. And, and I had told him, I said, look, I just before that, I told him, I said, look, my lawyer at that point, I got my ire up a little bit. And I said, my lawyer is the prosecutor. He's a, he, he, he's a, the state's attorney. When I talk to my lawyer and my lawyer talks to your lawyers because we're going to have charges filed against you. I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's when he said, well, you, you, you need to talk to my lawyer. And he hung up. So, you know, he ended up getting charged and getting jailed and and crying on camera in front of the TV station saying, everybody's calling me the polar bear thief. (laughs) And he acted like his feelings were hurt about it, you know, but uh, we ended up getting the polar bear back to the rightful owners and I was happy for them. And And that was an unlawful possession. Basically he he couldn't have it because he didn't have the documents to to prove. That's that's all it was. It's a simple case that was made a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yep. He was going to be stubborn about it. And I was stubborn too. So, you know, I, I think on my good cases, as you ask, the ones that stick out in my mind are sometimes the ones. I where, like that one, Carlos. Uh, That's my first polar bear story, and I really liked it. I, I <laughs> well, you know, it's the second polar bear case that I know of in Oklahoma wildlife history. <laughs> and uh, another game warden got one about 20 years ago on a similar deal. But um, you don't go looking for these things. No. They come and they come and find you. No doubt. And uh, this this family, you know, they came and found me because another game warden where they lived wouldn't touch it. And he told them, he said, you need to go talk to Carlos, <laughs> you know, as if, as if get Mikey, he'll try anything, you know, uh, let Mikey take a bite of it. He'll he'll taste it. Well, these guys came to see me and it wasn't my county, but long story short, I, I, I wring my hands and didn't touch it for a year because I didn't want to get in it. I saw it was a shit storm yep. <laughs> and I, and, and I could see that. I mean, I wasn't no dummy. I, I saw it was going to be problematic and I saw it wasn't no really good fish and wildlife case. So, you know, it wasn't, that's why I wanted a guy just to give the dang polar bear back and let's go down the road. Anyway, these, these guys finally kept on me and, and came to me and said, look, a polar bear is wildlife. How mm-hmm. is it this guy can have this polar bear and a, a, a threatened species? A lot of people think it's endangered, but, you know, in Oklahoma, it's declared a threatened species. And uh, yada, yada, yada. And they said, how can he do that? And I said, well, all right, put me on the spot. So that's when I called the guy. So anyway, he, I pushed a little, he pushed back. So I've had a few cases over the years where uh, I think I was right and I got sued. Uh, nobody likes to get sued, but I, I will tell you that uh, – I don't think I've ever been sued where I really did anything wrong. You, the, the state attorney would defend me and say, you know, as I read this, you didn't do anything wrong. Right. But again, like a slot machine, they ended up paying. So uh, that's, that's always disappointing to the game wardens because, you know, they want to see the bad guy right. uh, walk away kicking rocks. They don't want to see him walking away, cashing a check 
and uh, and the state just says, well, it's just not worth it. You know, by the time we spend all the work and attorney's fees and da 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 da, it's going to cost us a lot more than five thousand dollars, ten thousand yeah. dollars, or whatever they paid the guy. So and sometimes it's not about anyway. what's right; it's about the cost of it. And yeah, it's that, all that's, fiscal. That, that's yeah, frustrating. Risk risk management told us to settle. Yes, is what they typically will say. So <laughs> anyway, uh, that's frustrating for us. I was going to tell you probably. I don't know what my best case was. I've had some good deer cases. Let's do a little a uh, good deer case. A good deer case that I had was a deer case where before we had electronic internet check-in of your deer harvest and things like that, like a lot of people are doing nowadays and buying mm-hmm. licenses on online and all that. Before all that, we had physical check stations, you know, mm-hmm. where we still the do. biologists collect collected jaws and they mm-hmm. uh aged the deer by the teeth and they examined the antlers and they weighed the deer and you know there was there was a, a lot of uh, science that everybody was interested in and still trying to help uh, with our deer herds and so uh a a deer check station was a common gathering place for a lot of game wardens and a lot of sportsmen to go see deer and see what's coming in and who's gotten what and on this particular day uh, it probably was like opening day of gun season or something like that. High activity. I stopped by this, uh, this check station and there was a guy, uh, with his tailgate down and a gathering around him, admiring his deer. And his deer was a, about 175 inch deer. And it was a 23 point non-typical, you know, it was a really nice, nice big deer. I had a ride along with me that day and he's a good friend of mine. And that ride along looked at me and he said, that's the buck. That's the buck I was telling you about. And I said, what buck are you talking about? He said, last week when you and I were hunting, bow hunting, and I was in such and such deer stand, I had a 10 point that had me pegged in a tree. I couldn't move. He was looking right at me. He was 10 yards away and he was looking at me. I couldn't move. And he said, that 23 pointer was 20 yards away with his nose in a scrape. And I knew I couldn't draw my bow because the 10 pointer would blow the deal up. So I sat there and was froze by the 10 pointer and the 23 walked away. That's the deer. That's the same deer. I'm telling you. Most, most hunters know that a deer, his antlers are kind of like a fingerprint. I mean, there's just no two that are exactly alike. And it's a well-documented fact that you can make a lot of cases that way. So this deer was that deer. And it just so happened we knew where that deer lived and we knew the ranch that it was on and it was a 2000 acre ranch and it was so many miles for so many miles. And we knew I had permission to be on that ranch as did this guy that was with me. And this guy lived in a house adjacent to that ranch Hmm. when we pulled up and he didn't have permission to be on this ranch. And when we pulled up to the check station, he walks up to my, up to my car window and he says i've been wondering how long it was going to take for you to get here and uh, i thought you know what's what's he going to tell me here is he going to (laughs) give himself up or what you know and he said i've been calling all over trying to get you guys to come get over here to measure my trophy deer you know because uh i want to get him in the trophy books and you were supposed to come over here and and you're the guy that's supposed to measure him so so that's what he thought i was there to do i get (laughs) i get out my I get out my document that the state provides for entering deer into the record books. Uh And that document requires the the hunter to explain everything about the hunt. Tell us where he got the deer. Tell us about the hunt, what he shot it with, you know, yada, 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 all these details. Uh I'm I'm doing my interview to tell me about your hunt. (laughs) And he's telling me all about behind my house, yada, yada, yada. And I, and I know, now he's told me where he lives and I know his house and I know what's right behind his house. Mm-hmm. He didn't own, he didn't own an acre. Okay? <laughs> he, he backed up to this ranch. Long story short, and I don't know, Wayne, I'm bad about going on long stories and I don't, don't want to drag this out. But I think the details are what makes a, a fun story. I do too. The, 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 the gist of it is without making it even longer, the gist of it is, the guy told me about the person that helped him carry the deer out. And I had that guy's name and number. So I was able to interview this other person uh, as a, as a bit player in this whole case. And I was able to go back onto the ranch and find the gut pile, find the boot tracks of the people that made the gut pile, Mm -hmm. 
find the T-post that had been pulled out of the fence line and used as a uh, safari carrying <laughs> method for marching the deer out of the woods. And so here was the T-post, the a dirt sample, footprints, a gut pile for DNA connection to this particular deer and uh, all the photographs and then our personal mm-hmm. interaction with the deer from a deer stand. All of those things pointed to where this deer was killed on private property. It's well posted. Uh, he had no business going back there and all of that. And to kind of bring this case to a close, after talking to the prosecutors and explaining what we had, uh, the guy had a hunting without permission charge that would have been about $350. Part of the deal was he was going to lose his deer. He doesn't get to keep the uh, doesn't get to keep the head. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've explained to a lot of game wardens that I'm trying to teach about. Hey, you know, you seize that stuff, okay? Yes. Stop letting people keep all the deer meat and keep all the keep all the heads and stuff. And I explained to the prosecutors as t- uh, the, the same way. I said, listen, when you catch a guy burglarizing a house, do you let him keep the TV? Yeah. Just because he paid the fine, he paid the fine, he did the time, you're going to let him keep the TV? No, you don't. And and I said, I don't care what we're going to do with it. We don't let the thieves benefit from their crime and keep stuff. So I explained to the guy that you're going to pay about a $350 fine and you're going to lose the deer head. Oh, he hit the roof. He said, you just want to, and I explained to him what he'd done. Okay. I, I presented my evidence to him, said, look, here's, here's the deal. You know, you shot it back there. I know you shot it back there. You didn't have permission back there. Your, your buddy trespassed. You hunted without permission. We're not charging him. And, and there's more stuff that I could do to you. I said, we could charge you for, for an illegal deer. It's an illegal deer. Okay. You can't, you can't hunt on somebody else's property and call it a legal deer. So he argued with me and said, you just want my deer head. I know you just want the deer for yourself. And he said, I am not going to give into that. That's BS. And it's over. And so he argued. And I said, listen, here's the deal. I got a search warrant. I'm taking your head and we're going to hold your head as evidence. And I guess we're going to have to go to court on this deal. And he said, yeah, you're just going to have to go to court on this deal. Cause I ain't agreeing to none of that. Cause you just want my deer head. Well, the, the investigation that followed after he said, take me to court, led me to find out more that he had his 10 year old son with him when he shot this deer and come to find out uh, and, and checking the records a little bit better. This guy had killed an eight point buck with his rifle and used his deer tag on that buck when he harvested it a day or two before or before this just before this deer and and so when he when he shot this deer he was with his 10 year old son and it was his 10 year old son deer tag that he burned when he killed this buck so he, he saw the big buck he killed the big buck and he ended up killing the 10 point that and it's coming back to me now Wayne I apologize for my memory but basically these two deer came out of the same thicket. He shot the 10 point. And then after shooting the 10 point, the 23 come walking out and he shot the 23 point. And he put his 10 year old son's tag on the 10 point Mm -hmm. and he put his tag on the 23 point. And then, like I was saying, I went back and investigated a little bit with the 10 year old. Well, mom and dad were divorced. The 10 year old lived with mom Mm -hmm. in the next County over. And the 10 year old had always wanted to deer hunt. He lives in a rural County. All of his friends deer hunt. He always wanted to deer hunt and uh, he doesn't get to see dad very much, but he's going to, he's going to uh, want to be a deer hunter. So he mows yards, buys his own 30, 30 rifle. Mom buys him his deer tag. And so now this 10 year old is going out on his first deer hunt with his dad and dad burns his tag on an extra buck so that he can claim the 23 for himself. And that all came out in affidavits from the ex-wife wow. who's always usually a, a pretty negative wet witness against an ex-husband. <laughs> and, uh, she, she testified against the husband, the ex-husband and the 10 year old had also filled out an affidavit saying that, you know, this is what happened. I bought my last, bought my license, bought my rifle mowed yards, went deer hunting and I didn't shoot that deer. Dad shot the deer and all that. So it ended up being a case 
where when it went before the judge, the judge was just incensed over what this guy did with his 10 year old son. Absolutely. And he ended up taking his truck, giving him two weeks in the county jail, maxed out all the fines on him. Of course, he lost the deer head. And to this day, that deer head is hanging in the wildlife office uh, here in Tulsa. And it has been hanging there. And, and, and the plaque that I had made with it, uh, I got donated from, from different people. The plaque uh, calls it the $250 per point buck. Because when you do the math on, and, and back in, you know, probably 20 years ago when this happened, 15, 20 years ago, 23 points times $250. I don't know what that comes to, but that's, that's about what it boiled down to after I did the math. And he, he missed out on work for two weeks and lost his truck. And the judge also kept his boots. Uh, <laughs> he lost his rifle. He lost his boots. And the judge said that uh, should this case ever come up for appeal, this is evidentiary about the boot tracks and in, in the, uh, the to match up to the photographs of the gut pile and all. So we're hanging on to all of that. That's great. And uh, five thousand so seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Two fifty times much? five thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Two hundred fifty times twenty three. That, that's so you know for that's a pretty good deer, deer case, was, and, Carlos. And that was before we. We didn't have restitution back then. You know, now we've got restitution in Oklahoma where a trophy buck uh, can go up to $5,000 in addition to the fines. You know, some states have got some pretty braggadocious uh, restitution prices. Oklahoma, it's um, 1000 for a doe, 1500 for a buck, and it goes up from there up to 5000 depending on the size of the antlers. But this was a, was a real nice deer, and it's, it's still on display at our office and, and has that plaque there. So... You know, like I was saying, kind of like the polar bear deal, there's a lot of people that push these things because they don't think you're going to stand up to them. Right. Uh, you know, they make you prove your case and they make you fight back or they they kick you and go on down the road. Anyway, that was that was a good case. That's a great case. And, and I, I don't know how many times that as game wardens we investigate those types of cases where kids are involved. And, hey, it's very uncomfortable for us. But – I get so angry at the parent to put that child in that position that thank goodness that judge saw that and was disgusted as much as we are disgusted when that happens. Right. When you bring your child in there, you throw his tag on a deer that you shot, A, you scar him forever, forever. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, it's the rudest thing to do to a kid at that age, especially you take probably one of the the most sacred, the most awesome experiences of a kid's life, especially if he's in an outdoor family, hunting and fishing type family, and you take that away from him is something that I'm glad that judge recognized. And I think we would all like to get that type of fine for that type of case. Uh, cause it, and hey, that a, didn't come to light until after the guy <laughs> said, tough, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cooperate with you. $350 fine. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I'm with you. I've seen a lot of those cases, that where, hey, here, here's our offer, otherwise we're going to trial, and they think you're bluffing. And right. and, and then when you get to trial, sometimes a judge will take a, just like that, look at that, and throw the book at them, and they're like, uh, here, here's what you could have had, and here's what you ended up with. No doubt, and uh, and, and it works the other way at sometimes too, but th those are the good stories we like to hear. Uh, those are the, those yeah. are the winners. Those are definitely... Thank you. And, and it sounds like you did have some good judges down there that cared about kids, I think, and that interaction and uh, certainly had an effect on that judge that that father was going to do that to that child. I, I know we've probably run long, Wayne, but I'll just mention this to you if we don't have time to talk about well, we, we it. We so got plenty of time. Remember it. You keep talking, Carlos. We'll make this a t two sessions. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, 
And this is Warden's Watch.